mental health concern. My apologies, I'm possible. Health... That was just okay. letting us know that it would be recorded. Okay, okay, no problem. And so um, there are 20% of uh, adults ages 55 or older have had a mental health concern, um, but only about two or three receive treatment. And when we think about just mental health, just the taboo, that's one of the things, you know, and especially when it comes to, um, and I don't want to kind of put it out there, but I have to be honest because of what I've experienced and from conversations that I've had with patients and family members in my field is that it's a major taboo, especially for the African-American community. And one of the things is if we can begin to uh, see the power and see the move of God when things are beginning to be revealed and if we really take on the different uh, resources that are available, I believe that there's a lot of help and support that we could all receive. And so mental illness in the elderly is often overlooked it's often overlooked and it's actually challenged or connected to other diagnosis. And what happens is that because when we are, you know, as we begin to, to age and as we begin to grow older, there are certain health issues. And so oftentimes the emotional uh, part of an individual isn't always looked at as much as the physical, right? So more of those physical and chronic diseases, those are some of the things that are, are usually brought to the forefront. But as we look at uh, some of the uh, statistics again, and according to the World Health Organization, mental disorders affect approximately 15% of the population over the age of 60. And the number, this number is actually expected to increase as the population ages, right? And also there is, uh, when looking at anxiety disorders, these disorders affect 3.8% of older population. The CDC also states that people 55 and older, uh, an estimated 20% have some type of mental health concerns. Now, when I, as I'm you know, preparing for this and reading this, I'm like, Lord, I'll be 55 this year. So I'm, I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes big time. But it also talks about depression. Depression affects up to 5% of older adults but that number is also moving and it's going higher. And actually you have those that are in the nursing homes and healthcare facilities, that number is even increased even the more. And there was also a report that men ages 75 and older have a higher suicide rate than any other age group. And that was something that was shared. And so when we think about mental illness and how do we address it with the elderly? You know, despite some of the statistics and some of the things that are that are uh, mentioned throughout, you know, different uh, uh, research, it's really important that we begin to um, get a handle on what some of the symptoms are, what to look for, and also, you know, and and I, I hear just the, the chaplain coming out of me as well as. Um, as older adults that we really began to look at advanced directives, right? And also having those uh, medical power of attorneys, people that will be able to advocate for us if there is a situation we may find ourselves in and we're unable to speak for ourselves. So you wanna have somebody that you trust to also advocate and to also let people know what are your wishes and what are your concerns? And so when we begin to look at um, some of the main, some of the, these are some of the main symptoms uh, when looking at mental illness with the elderly. And so some of the things when you begin to think about it, as we grow older, there are a lot of things that, that hit our lives, you know, uh, sometimes if there's an illness, physical illness, it can cause, of course, depression because an individual is no longer able to, uh, you know, that meaning of life. So if it's working or if it's just being social and so these are some of the things that affect and bring on a lot of these disorders. And so a common, some of the common elderly mental health disorders um, that uh, we look at and that we see a lot of times in our elderly patients is depression. Depression is the number one and depression is a mood disorder that's ranked as one of the most um, persuasive uh, mental health concerns among older adults. And if it's untreated, it can lead to physical and mental impairments. And it also impedes, as I mentioned earlier, social 
functioning. And so in addition to depression, it can also um, interfere with symptoms and other treatments that cause other chronic health problems. And so some of the common symptoms of depression include ongoing sadness, problem sleeping, physical pain or discomfort, um, distancing from activities previously enjoyed and a general, just a slowing down. And so when we look at our seniors, seniors suffer from depression um, oftentimes and they don't talk to their doctors a lot about it. I know now a lot of doctors are doing what they call, it's like a mental health screening. And so there are like so many questions they ask you about on a scale from, I guess, maybe like just say one to five, you know, a five being the greatest where are you with just certain uh just daily functionings and based on your answers they begin to add them up and to see if there's any uh form of, of of depression and if we're honest one of the things that's important is that we are honest when we are actually taking these types of um surveys and so when the onset of uh depression so there is an a factor they say to watch out for. So one of the factors to watch out for, of course, is the physical illness. Another, when a person may lose a spouse, right? You have people who've been married for a number of amount of years, numerous amount of years. And so you have people who have spent, that's all they know is their, their spouse. And so there's a widowhood or you know, you lose that spouse. Also, um, one of the things it talks about is the, uh, the inability to function, as I mentioned earlier, about these things. So this brings on depression. And so the thing about depression is that depression can be treated in older adults. It can be treated. And so if we suspect a loved one or even ourselves are showing signs of depression, we should really see our doctor. We should see our doctor. And I know, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, again, like I said, it's a major taboo. You know, people don't want to take medication when you look at certain things, but there are supports out there to help us to remain balanced. I want to share a quick story with you before I go to the next one, which talks about anxiety disorders. When it comes to depression, with the elderly, it's really important that um, for those of us that may be caregivers or, or, you know, you have your adult children and now we see our parents and you can begin to see, uh, I don't want to use really the word deterioration, but you can begin to see decline. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You begin to see some decline. And so it's really important um, that when we do see decline, even in, in, in the elderly and our, be there our parents or older adults, that we do not treat them like children. That's one of the things. And a lot of times, you know, it, it's enough that there are certain things that we just have no control over. We have no control over aging gracefully, right? We have no control over that. And we may not have any control over some of the illnesses that may, may hit our bodies, but there are still uh, things in our lives that we may have control over, right? And so it's really important that we don't, um, rob them completely of their independence because they're already grieving their independence, if that makes sense to you. And so another uh, of the top four, remember depression is one. The second one is anxiety disorders. And so just like depression, anxiety is a very common mood disorder among the elderly. And so when you look at this, there are two problems that often appear. And so again, looking at some statistics, Older adults really experience a lot of uh, anxiety and it's also due to some of their depression. And so anxiety in seniors is thought to be undiagnosed simply because older adults, they tend not to emphasize their physical problems. They downplay anything that has to deal with the psyche. And that can, and, and, and to truly be honest, um, I would even say it's not even just something for elderly adults, but as adults, period, a lot of times we wanna downplay certain things. And so it's really important that we are honest about where we are and seek help. And I'm a firm believer there's nothing wrong with uh, having a, a, a counselor or psychiatrist or psychologist, as well as, you know, having someone even within 
a ministry that is that is uh, trained and aware of some of these different disorders to work together to support you. So that's really important that we support one another. And so women, particularly in the age group, are more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety disorders than men. And so looking at some of the risk factors for anxiety disorders in old age, okay? So generally it's um, feeling poor health, right? Anxiety, there's sleeping problems. There are some, amen, that may be suffering COPD. I see it a lot. I have patients who are older with COPD and there's a lot of anxiety. I cared for an aunt who had COPD. So there was a lot of anxiety when you can't breathe and things of that nature. So she had a lot of anxiety. Also thyroid disease, diabetes, some of these related chronic conditions can also be a risk factor for um, anxiety disorders with our older uh, population. Um, some of those things can also stem from medications. Remember medications, while we're taking them for one thing, there can also be another area where they are causing um, adverse reactions. And so some of the medications can, the side effects on those medications can also cause an anxiety disorder as well as physical impairment with daily functioning. And so also anxiety disorder, believe it or not, there's stressful events. Remember death of a spouse, a serious medical condition or a life-threatening event something else that is seen oftentimes that, that will breed this anxiety and can breed this anxiety disorder is traumatic or difficult childhood. Believe it or not, a lot of times, uh, not a, well, I'll say this, a lot of times, I'll stick with that, but I have definitely had several cases where there have been elderly patients or elderly uh, residents where they had major trauma as children. And it's not until they begin to get older that they are no longer able to hold all of these secrets in or all of these things. And then there's major anxiety. And so that is often seen a lot of times with our older population. As we're getting older, all of these things begin to flood up, these memories of old. And when they come up, they can be very traumatic, and especially when there are things that have not been dealt with, when there are things that have occurred within family systems and, and all of these things. So what happens is that some of these traumas can also promote anxiety disorders with our older population. And so it's very important that, again, if someone is feeling this way or you're feeling anxious all the time, that you do share this with your primary care physician. And so there are several different types of uh, anxiety disorders, but the most common disorder is the anxiety disorder and phobias. And so here we talked about, they gave a list, there's a list of some of the um, general anxiety disorders. And so here's one, excessive uncontrollable worry, right? Um, edginess, nervousness, restlessness, where people are just completely restless, uh, chronic fatigue or tiring out easily, as well as um, just agitation and complete irritability, poor sleeping habits, as well as tense muscle disorders. And so these phobias are fears. This is a paralyzing fear of something that usually poses a threat to the individual. Phobias can cause individuals to avoid certain things, certain situations due to this fear, this, this fear that's going on on the inside. And so because of that, they will, some close themselves off. That's when you have those social situations. They're no longer going out. They're no longer socializing. And to be honest, even with this past year, we have seen a lot of our elderly patients with the phobia, of course, the fear of contracting uh, coronavirus, the fear of, you know, losing a loved one, the fear of losing their own lives. And so I have definitely, we've definitely seen an increase of that over the past year. Another is a panic disorder. Panic disorders, this is intense fear. It just comes with heart palpitations, pounding rapid heartbeat, sweating, shaking, difficulty breathing. These are the feelings of doom. And so these are some of those panic disorders. And so another um, phobia, the third one, again, is bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness. 
It is often marked by unusual mood shifts, and we see it a lot in some of our elderly patients, especially those that may need to be that are like in our nursing homes. I've had a lot of patients um, where there was the bipolar disorder. And so because of that, you can also uh, experience or they can also experience these particular uh, disorders with dementia and Alzheimer's as well. So a bipolar disorder usually occurs um, within men and women during this age group. And so it also, bipolar disorder can also hit our young people as well. But when we begin to see the cases in our elderly population, there's more um, behavioral risks that come along with that. And so with that onset of the bipolar disorder with our elderly, there's confusion, agitation, irritability. And if you see all of these things are coupled in, they're all coupled. They're all coupled in confusion, agitation, irritability, right? Hyperactiveness, psychosis, cognitive issues, when memory loss, right? Problems remembering, problems, a uh, problem with solving problems, the loss of judgment or the loss of perception. And so these are some of the things that occur within our elderly. And the fourth and final is eating disorders, right? We're talking about mental illnesses within our elderly population eating disorders. Eating disorders are extremely high amongst our elderly population. And what happens is that there's a change in the taste and smell that's often due to medications. So these things, this can also play a factor in the eating disorder with our elderly. You're always like, mom, you gotta eat, you gotta eat. Also, um, memory and cognitive impairment can also uh, play a factor on eating disorders in our elderly, as well as the loss of a loved one. Again, depression, because I'm depressed, I have no appetite. So this as well plays into that. And so you wanna look out for signs um, with these eating disorders. And sometimes that's unexplained uh, weight fluctuation. You know, sometimes of course, as we age, a lot of times we may lose weight and we will lose weight, some of us, but at the same time, the fluctuation, there's also um, looking for signs of just muscle weakness and wasting away because again, the body begins to, to just really, you know, break down at some point. And so again, so you wanna look for the eating disorders, also dealing with again, depression, loss of appetite. So all of these things play into that factor. And so elderly mental health issues are issues that can also be supported. It's really important to have these support systems. Um, I know um, Minister Still, when we were um, texting and emailing, we had a conversation, even um, talked about, wanted to talk about, um, the, um, I'm gonna get here real quick with the uh, dementia, right? And so we're sharing that. And so dementia, of course, um, it is a name of a group of brain disorders, right? And it's so weird because Alzheimer's disease, this is, it's a, it's a disease where dementia there, it's like an umbrella. And I actually have, um, I don't know if I'm able to, to bring it up, but what I will do is I'm going to, I have an article, two articles, I'm going to email to her that she can email to you all and and so forth and so on, so that you'll have that. But it tells you about the different types of dementia. There are eight forms of dementia, but it also talks about the Alzheimer's disease itself. And so at this time, I'm gonna pause because I like to be obedient. And I was told to at least, you know, do a little teaching for about 20 minutes and it's actually 27. So at this time, I'm gonna pause if you'd like to dialogue at this time. Pastor Poole, this is Pastor Flores. Just, just thank you so much for sharing what you have so thus far. Uh, I want to ask if you had something that you wanted to share on the screen. I can, I can make that possible right now. Let me, let me see if I can pull this up. So I could make you a co-host, and you could do that. Let me see. Uh, where is it? Okay. Now, if you want, if you wanted to share something, you can do that. But if there's any um, other questions, from yes, um, Apostle Poole, the uh -huh. dementia and Alzheimer's. What is the difference? Where is the line drawn? You hear one and then one person might say dementia, another person might say Alzheimer's. And sometimes somehow they diagnose, like my aunt was diagnosed with dementia, but then they said she had Alzheimer's. So it all looks the same to me. What's the difference? Okay. So now there are, I know, I know it, it does get very, very tricky with dementia. So dementia, 
and I'm let me see. I'm trying to find. I had. Um, let me see if I can find this. Let me see. Okay. Um, let me see something. Let's see if I can screen share. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So when looking at dementia, and I, and I have this, I can actually, um, like I said, I can email it later. Let me move this over so I can see. So these are common, it's, it's really weird, I know. And I've been doing this for a while and it's still, it still, it tricks me up as well. But dementia, so this is, they said dementia is an umbrella, right? So it's described to use, it's described as a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. So with people who have dementia, they're forgetful, right? But they're also, and I have another, um, another uh, printout where it, there are eight different types of dementia, okay? So that's a whole nother, and I'll send that, and I'll, I'll maybe try to pull it up and we can try and go through this together as well. But dementia is the umbrella, right? So dementia forgetfulness, right? Cognitive impairment. Now here, these are the different diseases. So what they're saying is that dementia is a symptom, but it's not a disease. So Alzheimer's is a disease. This disease, right? This Alzheimer's disease, there's vascular dementia. I had several patients that had vascular dementia, Lewy body's dementia and frontal temporal, temporal dementia. And so there are some other dementias as well. They call them mixed dementia. But now with Alzheimer's disease, this is the type of disease. And as Alzheimer's with this disease, not only is there memory loss, right? Let me pull this up, see if I can pull it up here. Um, let me move that back over. And I'm not sure I was, there was a video I had, but I don't think the video is, um, I think it's too long, but I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you the link. But with, with Alzheimer's disease, it talks about there's a buildup, there's a buildup of particular cells and uh, that, and I guess like a plaque on the brain. And so with dementia, what happens is that it begins to break down people, the person, the individual with Alzheimer's disease. They no longer, at some point as the disease progresses, they forget speech, swallowing, um, completely um, incontinent. Uh, most will even um, go back into a fetal position, right? And so with the Alzheimer's disease, with dementia, and I've had several patients, of course, even with Alzheimer's disease, and it also, even with dementia as well, because again, it kind of bounces back and forth because there can be some similarities with dementia, right? And the different types of dementia. However, when it comes to dementia, they're saying that it's a symptom. It's, it's symptomatic in terms of Alzheimer's disease being a actual disease. And it's really weird because when I have had the experience, I lost a loved one this year um, to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so its progression is very rapid. It's very rapid. And so the individual loss, of course, memory first, then the ability to walk, the ability to speak, the ability to swallow. And so with when looking at Alzheimer's, I'm going to try to pull this up too, because I think I have this. Um, can you see that? Eight, yeah. The dementia and eight stages of dementia. Okay, because I'm going to also send this. So it talks about it being an illness that usually occurs slowly over time and usually includes a progressive state of deterioration, right? So with dementia, again, memory problems, confusion, changes in the way a person behaves and communicates. So there's these cognitive, let me move this over, cognitive disorders, right? Cognitive symptoms of dementia can include poor problem solving, difficulty learning new skills, 
impair decision-making, behavioral changes, that include, remember that fear, insecurity, anger, often depression sticks in as well. So this here, looking at dementia, right? So when looking at Alzheimer's disease, and this is something that's so important or strokes called vascular or multi-infarct um, infarct, uh, dementia, these decrease blood flows to the brain. So dementia is a disease, dementia, I'm sorry, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. So it's really weird, but it all, it's like, it's dementia is the umbrella, Alzheimer's is a disease, but it also will reflect the symptoms of dementia that comes with the, the de deterioration, deterioration, I'm trying to speak here. So I want to show you this um, here. What's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Dementia can be caused, they have here by AIDS, high fevers dehydration, right? One of the things that I've seen also alcoholism, one of the things also, and I'm gonna share this, that's really important for our elderly population. And as we begin to, old, um, to age, anesthesia. A lot of times people don't realize it, but when you have had multiple surgeries, right? They're placing you under anesthesia. I have a dear friend now whose husband, um, he had really two major surgeries, but one was really major. He had a back surgery. He underwent anesthesia. Now he's an older gentleman, right? So when he came out of the first back surgery, this was just pre-COVID, um, he had a, a difficult time coming out of the anesthesia. When he came out of the anesthesia, he was still extremely foggy and forgetful. He was very fearful and scared because he was having difficulty remembering, right? So at some point he was starting to feel better, but then probably about four months after the back surgery, he needed open heart surgery. He had open heart surgery. So remember, he's under anesthesia for an extensive period of time. So when he comes out, this major cognitive, I mean, major, he was completely confused, very forgetful and extremely fearful because he knew that something was wrong, but he couldn't quite put his finger on what was wrong. Just recently within the past week, I received a text from his wife who said that he had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So they're going to see a neurologist in another week to do some tests. They're gonna see if there's some medications that they could possibly um, prescribe and, and give to him to help him with this. And so what I've noticed, and even when I had the nursing home, that uh, some of our elderly patients, like some of the surgeries that they would uh, undergo when coming out of those surgeries, it left, it left them more confused or if an individual suffered from a cerebral hemorrhage, which is a stroke. And so that also brought on like dementia, right? And then a form of Alzheimer's. And so again, let me see if I can, okay, here we are. So there's common types of dementia and their typical characteristics. And this here is what I'm gonna also email to um, Reverend Steele. So it says here, this is Alzheimer's disease. It's a disease, right? This is the disease and it's common, right? It's the most common type of dementia. I know it's confusing because they just said that dementia wasn't a disease, but this one is the most common and it accounts for 60 to 80% of cases. And what happens, there's difficulty rem remembering names, recent events is often um, an early clinical symptom later than symptoms uh, that include impaired judgment, deterioration, confusion, behavioral changes, and trouble speaking, swallowing, and walking. I had a patient once that slept 23 hours in a day. She had Alzheimer's. She slept 23 hours 
the interesting thing was that they would feed her. They would still feed her. It was a parade diet. She never opened her eyes. She would be asleep. She would wake up for just one hour, 23 hours of nothing but sleep. And so when looking at this, and so then these are the, the types of dementia. There's the um, frontal temporal dementia. And they say that this, uh, the symptoms include uh, changes in personality and behavior, difficulty with language. I had a patient um, who was diagnosed very early with this type of dementia. And to look at the person, you would think like, oh my goodness, this is just a, a nice woman. But when she opened her mouth, she, her words were just like, like baby talk, like babbling, like babbling. And so the constant also, the PICS disease, where they're constantly PICS, you know, constantly. And so there were some things that were happening with this particular woman with the type of dementia. Then there's vascular dementia, right? This is the second most common type of dementia. It's an impairment that's caused by a decreased flow of blood to parts of the brain. And this is often due to like series of strokes and blocked arteries. Symptoms often overlap with those of Alzheimer's disease, although memory may not be um, seriously affected. So the memory they're seeing here with this vascular dementia is that maybe you're, you're, you don't have as much severe memory loss, but there are some forms of dementia where you are dealing with some loss of memory and some loss of things. Then I had um, several with the Lewy bodies dementia, right? This, is, this deals with problem solving, memory, judgment, behavioral changes, very combative. So this is a, a alertness and severity of cognitive symptoms and they may fluctuate from day to day. And so these are some of the things they deal with hallucination, um, uh, tremors. Um, and so some of those things that are occurring in the body and this is with the Louis body's dementia. Um, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Are there any questions right now? Um, anything we wanna discuss or talk about? I think somebody's muted. Any questions? Any I, I, I have a question. Um, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. I, I just wondered, um, Apostle Poole, if there is much information available around um, prevention? Well, uh, you're talking about with like dementia or now I was listening to a study and in terms of uh, dementia, they say there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. There's no cure for that. And basically you would think that there's no cure for dementia either. They say that it's not hereditary. Some say that it is. And so again, you have different researchers, but in terms of um, one of the things, and like I said, I was watching a, uh, a video. I'm going to send that also um, to Reverend Steele, but I was watching a video of a gentleman who was actually a college professor in psychology, whose wife was, I think she was 60, either 64, or 65, and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. She was arrested when she forgot her two-year-old, um, I think it was a two-year-old grandson uh, in a hot car, right? Um, she, she forgot. And that's when she was diagnosed. They learned of her diagnosis. And so the husband, and of course, you know, we all forget sometimes, you know, where I put my keys, uh, you know, you walk into a room and you forget, well, what, what did I come in here for? And you're really thinking, thinking hard. And so Needless to say, he was heartbroken and devastated when he found out that his wife has this disease because in his heart of hearts is that, wait a minute, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together and, and, and do all these great, wonderful things. So eventually he had to, um, he said, get like a nanny for his wife because and she went into a deep depression. And that's another thing. She went into a very deep depression. But one of the things he said as he was researching in terms of like dementia, Alzheimer's, this whole cognitive impairment that deals with the mentation of an individual. Um, he said he found a study and a few studies that all that kind of link this plaque that they find on the brain to um, a bacteria that lives in the mouth. 
So I was, I didn't com completely finish watching the video, but he was explaining how um, there was some research at, I want to say he said the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and then there was another um, research someplace else where he was comparing this research that talked about um, possibly a bacteria that lives in the gum, the roots of the gums. Now, one of the things I know for sure is that this body that God created, it is just simply one of the greatest machines ever built. And your, our, our, our teeth, our nerve endings, they're all connected to different parts and different rather, um, oh gosh, what's the word is escaping me? Right. Organs, thank you, Holy Spirit. So these nerve endings. Years ago, and I haven't done it in a while, but years ago, I used to, um, they call it um, oil pulling, where it's just a constant an oil pull, where it's um, olive oil or like a grapeseed oil, a cap full, and would just squish, 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 because that's supposed to pull bacteria out of the gums. But this gentleman was saying in his research, I didn't finish watching it. I want to finish watching it to see where it's going. But he was indicating that if we can, I guess, keep the mouth clean, he was saying that, that it's something to do with a bacteria that lives in the gums and that it's not something that's necessarily hereditary. It hits some people and not others. One of the things in my field that I have noticed and I thought was really interesting is that yes, um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease can possibly hit anyone. But one of the things I've noticed, and I had a conversation with a doctor who was from India, was that um, when it came to um, Asian and Indian patients, that population that um, for any of these memory loss, cognitive diseases, they were very low. Um, mainly, you know, African Americans, Caucasians. I know that um, in some of the other cultures, their eating habits, as well as different um, herbs that they use with cooking. And so a lot of them were not suffering from cognitive impairment, but there were a lot of our, like, again, I said, African-Americans and Caucasians that suffered with dementia. Most of them in the nursing homes that I see are either black or white. It's very far and few in between where we would see that. And we were talking about that and she was saying that it was true. I know in the Indian culture, they use a lot of like turmeric and things of that nature that helps with like inflammation and a lot of things. And so again, people have said for sure that inflammation and mucus and things in the body is what creates a lot of diseases. And so, um, you know, just eating healthy and, and things of that nature. I mean, when I think about my... Um, my mother-in-law, she knew that she was getting forgetful. So of course she went into depression. She was afraid to go out because she was embarrassed or scared that she would embarrass herself because she knew that she was having difficulty remembering. And so um, there was that fear. And then eventually um, now there are notes, stickies all around where we eventually had to un unhook her stove and the microwave because she was putting things in them that didn't belong inside of the microwave or she would turn on the stove and forget that the stove was on and burning pots and things of that nature. So eventually had to unhook all of these, these things. And of course, um, had someone there with her, of course, during the day, but, you know, uh, turn off the light or just different things, you know, uh, lock the door, all of these sticky notes were all over to try to help her remember and then it just got to the point where I think for me, the biggest, um, the day of hurt, and I remember her and her having a conversation and she was just crying and she was like, oh, Chantel, she said, I feel like I'm losing my mind. And um, she said, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, if I lose it. And I remember, you know, we had that type of relationship. And I remember saying to her, I said, mom, I said, don't worry. I said, if you lose it, you won't know anyway. So she kind of chuckled. She it brought her out of that. She laughed and she said, you know what? That's why I love you. You know, but ultimately, you know, we were there for her. And one of the things, you know, um, my prayer was like, oh God, I pray that she never forgets me. And it got to a point where she forgot my name. And it was like 
she would see me and say, I know we go way, way back. You understand? She knew that we went way back, but she didn't remember who I was to her or any of her, her children or any of her grandchildren. But she remembered that we went way, way back. And for me, that was good enough that she remembered that we went way, way back. Are there any other questions right now? Yes, Apostle Poole, I would like to ask um, uh, the, the diseases or the order, disorders that you shared, most of it is around about, uh, about with fear. So what information that you can give, not just only to the caregivers, just to the families or the ones on line who have loved ones or friends that you can give to them to help them? Because sometimes because of fear, because of, of shame or embarrassment, that people, they do shun away from mm -hmm. Their loved ones, they may not say it, but inwardly, you know, they're really pulled back because of the behavior. And sometimes they don't help the caregiver who's there mm -hmm. all the time. This is so true. Um, some, I'm sorry. I was going to say, what are some encouragement that you can give to the ones who are listening, you know, when they confront this situation? I think one of the most important things that any of us can do if we're facing a situation like this, um, and I'm twofold, again, when, when you're the caregiver, right? As a caregiver, we can, we see things, we notice things. Um, it's really important that there is a support system for that individual, right? Mm -hmm. That individual needs a support system, especially if they're the caregiver, because at some point there's caregiver fatigue when you're just so tired. I know that um, in my own case, there are some with that in that early stages where they just, they just ramble, they're back and forth and they rummage through stuff and she's looking for things and constantly, you know, this constant going back and forth. And um, I have a dear friend who's a pastor she just recently had to um, place her mother in, it's like an assisted living facility, but it's for mm -hmm. people with uh, cognitive impairment. And I yeah. think what's important is, you know, planning and really looking at these things. There are times where we may be able to keep a loved one at home, right? Yeah. Um, if, if, especially if it's dealing with like dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But if you have a loved one, who is still walking strong. I mean, it's walking and they're like all over the place. Get outside. You've seen it sometimes on the news that individual is lost or looking for them. These are the yeah. times where as difficult as it may be, where for their safety, for their safety to have mm -hmm. them placed, to have them, you know, placed in an environment where there are people that are going to be there to support them and to be there to help them. And for the individual who is dealing with a loved one in this case, the only thing that we can do is to really support those individuals and to be sympathetic and empathetic because mm -hmm. we never know what's going to hit our lives. And so there are times where, sorry. you know, sorry. I'm sorry. Do something about it. But... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I would say definitely encouraging the person and letting them know that you're there, that you support them. And who, listen, maybe taking a cooked meal over sometimes. If, if you're mm -hmm. able to, you know, maybe give them the opportunity if someone is caring for a loved one at home, maybe um, sitting with that person for a few hours so that the caregiver can get out just to yeah. do something for themselves. You know what I mean? So those things are important. When I work with hospice, we would set things up. I would encourage the caregiver, listen, you know, go out, go shopping, go get your hair done or whatever. Just take a nice walk. Maybe you just want to take a nap. You go, we're going to sit here and we're going to make our day go where, guess what? I'm going to sit for two hours. Somebody else is going to come and sit for two hours. And that gives the caregiver the support that they need 
especially if they are caring for a loved one in the home. You have some yes. that become combative, right? Right. Combative, mm -hmm. very combative. And at some point, that is when you need to make the decision to have them placed where they will be safe and cared for and where you can also support them. A lot of times the spirit of guilt, right? Yeah. Can yes. hit us so deeply, but ultimately we have to think about the safety of the individual. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What effect does it do to the person that has dementia the ones that are associated with them, around them, they, they are being in denial. That's true. That's true. And, and sometimes, not just denial, but a lot of times, you know, in the early stages, an individual, you know, it may not always be as evident, but you do have, because I will say this, um, with our family member, there was definitely, uh, her children were in denial because of course, especially if it's That's a parent, you see that parent, you see that parent being the strong one and the person you go to for advice. And so they were in a, in a, in a state of denial and there will be times when she would forget something and her son would yell at her, mom, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And you know, then that would make her fearful and scared. And then I would have to be the advocate. I'd have to be the one to, to back people off of her because they were having a difficult time with the fact that she knew something was wrong. And I believe a part of them knew something was wrong, but they didn't want to face that something was wrong. And it's it's just important that um, you know we really have these conversations because when when I begin when you begin to look at all of these situations, there are so many things. What's going to happen when, of course, the individual in your life, if it's not just dementia, or Alzheimer's, or some other type of terminal illness? How do we support the family? How do we support the individual? And then when is enough enough, right? When is enough enough? You know, I've seen people with loved ones that are literally, I mean, intubated. You look at, I mean, literally like, I mean, I just yesterday I sat with a woman and her 81 year old husband intubated and she would not, you know, and then you don't want to force people, not forcing, but just to try to find out where people are. He was 81 years old, intubated. And um, at first she was going to move him to hospice. We have an inpatient hospice unit at the hospital. And um, he was so critical. I mean, they were giving him medications to keep his pressure up. His body was breaking down and he was oozing, like just fluid oozing out of him. And they wanted her to make a decision about his care. And I sat with her and she shared with me because she then she even said it out of her own mouth. She said, oh, they need to come and wipe him up. You know, they need to, you know, come and clean him up, you know, because he's dying, right? So I, I did kind of explore the fact, I said, he, and you're right, he does. And they were coming in to, to clean this person, her husband. And so um, she said, well, I was told when they take out the tube that he may not make it over to the unit, right? And so we, we explored that and what that looked like for her. But really, and what I've seen in a lot of families when it comes to these type of end of life decisions, they feel like they're the reason that their loved one passes away because they feel like, oh, I got to pull this plug. And at the end of the day, it's all artificial. Like everything they were doing, it was all artificial, you know, and he kept beeping and beeping the whole time because they're giving him medications to try to keep his pressure up because literally the man was, he was really dead but they were still trying to keep him alive. She was still trying to keep him alive. Um, and so ultimately um, last night, when I got in this morning, I checked his file 
he passed away. He just, he just passed away. He just kept, and one of the things I did ask her, I said, I want to ask you this. I said, if his heart stops, what do you want them to do? I said, do you want them to give him CPR? And at that point she said, no. And I said, I, I agree because it's traumatic and people don't realize that. I have sat through codes with individuals and it's not like what you see on TV. You know, they're doing those compressions. If you have an, a weak elderly person, they are breaking their ribs, it's trauma. And so now, you know, they're already, you know what I mean? And so it, it's bad, it, it, it really is. I've seen some really bad deaths because of that. And so when thinking about it, when do we, when, when I think about this, you know, um, years ago, years ago, I know probably, I mean, individuals would pass away at home, right? When we read in the Bible, we see where his eyes were growing dim and he would call in all of his children, right? And he would bless them and he would do all of these things. And so he was surrounded by love, right? He was surrounded by love. And so ultimately it's love that's in that room. And so when, when we, we, we have to really, you know, begin to explore and think about our own lives, think about our own uh, end of life and what does that look like? You know, God forbid if I were to be stricken with a terminal illness and if they said there was no cure, right? How do I want my days to be? Because remember, we say quality of life, right? But what is the quality of life if, if I'm intubated and I can't move and now you give me a feeding tube and all of these things and then ultimately what you're doing is prolonging the inevitable right and so one of the things and, and this is my heart my passion and I'm, I'm actually I'm getting get maybe certified because I'm also an end of life doula they call them a deaf doula so an end of life doula and what that is is is, is being there and it doesn't mean that Oh, you know, when people even hear hospice, the first thing they think about is death. And I was like, I had hospice patients for years, right? It's just for years. It's just people who have decided that, wait a minute, I don't want any more chemotherapy. I don't want any more of this. I want to, I want to complete my bucket list. I want to go and visit my grandchildren. I want to go down South and see some of my friends. I want to, you know, all of these things. And as the church, right, we love the Lord and we want to see Jesus, right? But if the rapture doesn't come, how do you think we're going to get to them? It's through transition. It's through transition. And so not being fearful to have these type of conversations and not being fearful, you know, and of course, I mean, like, it's not like, it's like oh, I want to die. But ultimately, you know, if your heart is right and just getting yourself ready, because no man knows what a day may bring. You don't have to have an illness to pass away, right? You don't. But it's also knowing, and when you're dealing with, especially our elderly people, I mean, I had a woman that was 103 years old, and guess what? Her sons, they were like 70 and 80 themselves, and they didn't want to let mama go. I get it. But here it is, this frail little lady, and they wanted them to give her CPR. Now, this is what I need people to think about. Think about the nurse that has to jump on top of your mother or your father, <clears throat> Think about them feeling Man. their bones breaking under their hands because they have to do what you want them to do, right? If you're saying do it, but at the same time, think about the trauma. You have no idea how many nurses that I've spoken with after those after those call those uh, CPR codes that have cried, that say that they got to go home and have a drink, that they got to go. You know what I mean? You know because this is what we also put them through, but we don't see that that way. And so it's really important. I mean, we lost my mother, um, but four years ago, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer Gotta and she thought she had a virus. She thought she had a, a virus, stomach virus. Well, come to find out that December of 2016, she was diagnosed with pancreatic stage three cancer. That's a cancer they say is really difficult to even determine if a person mm -hmm. has pancreatic cancer. When they find out it's usually in the latter stages, right? Mm -hmm. And so she was diagnosed in December. She moved in with me and my husband. We cared for her in January and February she passed away. And so it was just that quick. But I remember the day that she passed away, nobody, I mean, we knew that she was dying. She knew that she was dying. 
and she literally walked across the floor and told me she felt like she was about to faint. And literally I caught her in my arms, laid her on the bed and I could see where she was going. And she made a couple of little sounds. I put on some worship music. I called everybody that was in the house to the bedside and that's where she passed away, you know? And so in my, in my field and in my role and one of the things even as, as a doula um, is wanting to be able to be there, to have these legacy, to create a legacy project, to create something for the generations that are behind us, right? You know, people that are good historians right. in your family, you want them to be able to tell the story about the people they'll never get to meet in person, but yet this is this is this is our heritage. This is our this is our you know inheritance right here. This is who we are. These are the the values. These are the the uh, things that we put into motion as a family. And so it's important that these stories and these memories don't die. But you know, and I'm not to say anything against our millennials. But at the end of the day, we have to have we gotta we gotta write the book, you know. And so our lives are full of. Uh, adventure and life and, and all of these beautiful things that God has given us. And so we need to be able to pass them on. And so when we're able to do that, I think there's a level of peace that we also have. No, we don't want to be separated from the people that we love, but we don't want them to suffer, especially when we already know that ultimately um, it's going to be what it's going to be. Apostle Paul, we yes, are yes. so thankful that you came this evening you have given us a wealth of information mm -hmm. you have given me clarity and i also think of this clarity on the difference of of the aging of the, what they're going through especially with the dementia and all top all Alzheimer's diseases and i just thank you for being so open about what what all of us may one day have to uh, face if we haven't already faced it with our own parents. Uh, Pastor, I was wondering how are you after this presentation? Because we know that you are away in California because yeah, his you. mother yeah. is- um, yeah. yeah, and some of what- His father today. passed not too long ago so and sorry. his mother yeah. is going through dementia. Yeah. So I'm asking, I would, thinking about you the whole time. How are you feeling with this presentation? This has been a blessing, uh, Apostle Poole. I, I think there's so much great information there. Uh, I think the, the, I think in particular, the blessing of letting people go when, it, when, when it, it's a time for us to go, right? The scripture says there's a time. Uh, and then so many of us, we don't want to let God take them. And we do all these kinds of things. So I really appreciate your, your blessing on that, that it's all right to let them go into the hands of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and in, again, uh, she mentioned also about uh, helping out the caretaker. My brother Paul and his wife have been full time with my mom now with her Alzheimer's mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard on them. So that's why I've taken a week off to come over here and, and, and try to relieve him. And um, uh, I was supposed to go to Texas for my family reunion, but he, he wanted to go. So I said, you go and I'll take over for you here uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and be a blessing to him that way. Um, and then people are bringing me meals over here. I don't know if you saw that. Somebody came and brought me dinner right now from my mom. Oh, okay. as a way of helping out. And, and the, uh, boy, uh, Apostle Poole, uh, I just want to say thank you. And I want all of Zion, if you can unmute your phones and just uh, give Apostle Poole a round of applause and thank her thank for you. Thank 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 you. Very much, thank you. Very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. God you. Thank you so much. You. Thank 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 you. Thank